this is the only home server you should buy. At least, that's what a lot of people down in the comment section keep telling me. And they're not talking about this specific PC, but the M100 CPU inside. The Intel N100 is a really impressive processor on paper, with performance that rivals that of desktop CPUs from only a few years ago, while only having a TDP of 6 watts. For many people looking to do some simple self-hosting, is something like this the perfect solution? Well, in today's video, I'm going to talk about what you can expect from this specific mini PC, as well as many others like it, and see if the N100 inside is all it's cracked up to be. Oh, and also talk about why this CPU might not be as green as you think. Let's get started. Now, I love self-hosting, but if you want to quickly get a website up and running the easy way, there isn't really a better option than using Squarespace, the sponsor of today's video. I've talked before about how easy and approachable Squarespace is, and I love that I can use it to quickly make tweaks to my website without having to dive into any coding. But Squarespace has a ton of other features you might not even be aware of, like email campaigns. Whether you're looking to build your brand, drive sales, or just let your audience know about some new content, email campaigns are a great way to keep everyone in the loop. With Squarespace, you can easily design stunning emails, manage your subscriber lists, and even build automations. So if you're looking to start a website or build some email campaigns, head on over to squarespace.com slash hardwarehaven and use my code at checkout to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. In my videos where I cover home servers and such using old hardware, I get a lot of comments asking why I don't use N100s. And yeah, that makes sense in a lot of ways. There are a ton of affordable mini PCs with the N100, and they're probably going to be more efficient than most of the hardware I cover on this channel. And it's not like I haven't wanted to cover an N100, I've just been busy and haven't really gotten around to it, but today is the day. If you hop on a website like Amazon, you can find as many models of N100 mini PCs as there are rebrands to the USB 3 spec. But while I was looking to buy one, Camrui reached out and offered to send over their AK2 Plus Mini. Now, just like with any other brand that sends over hardware, Cam Rui had no input as to what I say, the topics I cover, or my opinions about this PC, and they don't get to see it until you do. Hopefully, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you know that I strive to be honest and transparent, but if you don't trust me, that totally makes sense, and I get it. You probably shouldn't. But hopefully, I can still provide some helpful information. Obviously, the AK2 Plus Mini features the N100, with four Alder Lake efficiency cores capable of boosting to 3.4 GHz. Four threads and 3.4 GHz probably doesn't sound like a lot, but the point of the N100 is to be efficient. The Alder Lake E cores aren't quite as powerful as their P core counterparts, but they're still very competent, especially when compared to older processors. The AK2 Plus Mini also comes with 16GB of DDR4 SOTA memory, as well as a 512 M.2 SATA drive. There's only one slot for memory, but that's because the M100 only supports single channel memory, so having a second socket doesn't really provide that much value. And this features a SATA M.2 drive instead of NVMe, because, well, these have to be affordable somehow. The AK2 Plus Mini currently costs just $170 and has been available for even cheaper. And the only way this is really possible is for the manufacturer to cut costs where they can. And this becomes really evident when you just pick this thing up. The entire system weighed only 383 grams. That's less than twice the weight of an HP Elite Desk G3 Mini, and still lighter than even the Kados Mind that I recently covered, which is substantially smaller. Pretty much the entire case is made from plastic, and it feels rather cheap. I mean, just listen. Now, obviously, a plastic case doesn't really mean anything in terms of performance or even usability, and I know most of you watching this video probably won't care, but I wanted to make you aware anyway. The AK2 has rather minimal I.O. with just two USB 3.0 ports, two USB 2 ports, gigabit Ethernet, a combo audio jack, and barrel jack for DC power. Now this does have dual HDMI ports, which would be great for office use, but for more home server stuff, I would have personally loved to see dual NICs, which you can actually find on systems that are similarly priced and specced. I also would have loved to have seen at least one Type-C port, at least on the outside. Now, one thing I did love about this is easy access to the internals. You just slide a small locking tab to open the top, and you can easily access the 2.5-inch drive bay. After removing just three screws, you can get to the single DDR4 SODIMM socket, and also this weird USB-C port, which as far as I can tell, doesn't do anything. Having easy access to both the RAM and 2.5-inch drive bay is great, but things got a bit more messy when trying to replace the boot drive. 
You have to disassemble the entire case and pull the motherboard out, which is a bit of a pain. Off camera, I actually broke off one of the Wi-Fi antenna connectors just trying to maneuver the motherboard out of the case. Now realistically, it's not that hard to do, especially when compared to working on a laptop or something, for example. And realistically, I should have been a little bit more cautious, but it still would have been nice to have easier access to the M.2 slot. The motherboard was pretty much a straightforward little single board computer with not much in terms of extra expandability. The Wi-Fi module is soldered in, so don't get your hopes up about adding in any M.2 E key devices. The board is actively cooled, and I have to give Camrui some credit here, because while testing, I don't think I heard this thing once. Granted, it's probably not that hard to cool a 6 watt TDP chip. And that's pretty much all there is to say about this mini PC, so let's talk about how it and the N100 performed. I started off in Windows 11, which was pre-installed, and as to be expected with any modern CPU, basic usage was snappy and pleasant. Now I've seen a lot of places online where people compare the performance of the N100 to something like the i5-6500. I didn't have that specific CPU on hand, but I do have my HP Elite Desk Mini G3, which has an i5-6500T, and I thought this would make a pretty suitable comparison. Starting with Cinebench R15, the N100 was actually 11% slower than the i5-6500T. I switched to the much newer Cinebench R23 to see if things could get better there, but not really. The N100 was 16% slower than the older i5, at least when running the multi-threaded test. When switching to the single-threaded test, the N100 was 12% faster. I also ran PC Mark 10, where the systems performed pretty similarly. The N100 system performed a bit better in the Essentials category, which is probably due to its better IPC and newer integrated graphics. The older i5 took the lead in the content category, probably thanks to its better multi-threaded performance. Okay, so the N100 wasn't faster than an 8-year-old low-powered desktop chip. So what? It was way more efficient, right? Right? Well, yes and no. When just sitting idle in Windows, the AK2 Plus Mini drew 6 watts from the wall, while the HP Elite Desk drew 7.4 watts. When under load though, running Cinebench R15, the N100 system drew 56% less power than the G3 Mini, while only being 11% slower. So while the idle power draw of both these systems was pretty much the same, the N100 system was much more efficient when running a heavy workload. But this is running Windows, and you guys don't care about Windows, you want to know how this runs Linux and how it works as a home server. So to keep things simple, I installed Debian with Casa OS so I could quickly spin up some containers. I ran Home Assistant, Jellyfin, AdGuard Home, and Crafty, and also set up an SMB share, and I did all of that without any issues. I ran into one really cool thing when setting up Jellyfin, and that's that this integrated GPU does a really great job of transcoding. It's not based on the newer Iris Xe graphics, but still handles transcoding tasks really well. I was able to transcode a 10-bit HEVC 4K stream at over 100 frames per second, and when enabling VPP tone mapping, the M100 still turned out over 80 frames per second. So the M100 is really impressive for transcoding, so if you're looking at streaming with Jellyfin or Plex or MB and you want to have really large files and transcode them down, the N100 is going to be a great option for that. Now the CPU did show a bit of a weakness when running a vanilla Minecraft server. Whenever I would run really fast to generate new terrain, you would see the CPU spike up well over 70%. Now I didn't really notice any issues in game, but I was also by myself. Regardless, if you do run a Minecraft server with this, there are ways to optimize things, and you could probably get it working fairly well, but you might run into issues if you're looking to run some large or busy servers. While running all of these services, minus the Minecraft server, the AK2 Plus Mini only drew 4 watts from the wall, which is really impressive. Until I installed the exact same setup on the HP Elite Desk G3 Mini, and saw that it only drew 5 watts from the wall at idle. Now clearly the older i5 is going to draw more power when actually doing stuff, so the N100 PC is still more efficient. And by buying a more efficient PC, you're going to be saving money and saving the environment. So that's about it for this one. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, well, it's, it's not that simple. Sure, something newer is going to be more efficient and therefore save you money on your power bill, but how much? And if you already own something or can find something used for half the price, let's say, which one's going to be the more affordable option? Well, that starts to get really tricky, especially if you're not just trying to figure out what's going to save you the most money, but what's also going to be best for the environment. Let's hop over to my computer and take a look at some stuff really quick. Okay, so I'm over here at my computer and I have this little calculator pulled up because I find this kind of stuff fun. You might not, and I apologize, but yeah, let's dive into it. 
So right here I have my two PCs, the i5 here with the 6500T and the one with the N100. And what we can do is we can give it some idle power draw numbers here. Like let's go with our Linux numbers. So five and four. And so this will generate how many kilowatt hours per day, but we have to give it a cost. So where I live, it's about 12 cents a kilowatt hour, but let's go with something like 35, which might be more representative of something in, oh, not $35, geez, 35 cents which might be more representative of somewhere in Europe, for example. And then we can give it a number of years. So let's say over the course of three years. And we can see with this cost for power in over three years, we'd be paying $36 or $37 roughly for the N100 PC and 46 for the i5 6500T. But we also have to think through the cost that we're purchasing these systems for. So for the N100 PC, you know, if we spent $170 on that Camry AK2, and then let's say, I feel like it's probably fair that you could find the HP Elite Desk with an SSD for around $100, if not less. So if we put that value in, we can see over the course of three years, even paying 35 cents per kilowatt hour, we'd be spending more money on the newer system. Now to be clear, these numbers aren't exact. This isn't an exact science. This is just sort of getting a rough idea of what some of these costs might actually look like. And I find it helpful to put stuff into a spreadsheet like this to get a better idea of what we would actually be spending if we were looking at these two options. Now to be fair, these systems probably aren't going to be sitting completely at idle all the time. So let's let's give some numbers here, like maybe six watts for the N100, and let's go up to like 15 for the i5 6500T. Say occasionally they are crunching some data and they're gonna draw a little bit more power. Well, now we can see that over the course of three years with that power cost, we're gonna spend a little bit less on the N100 in total versus the older i5 system. And then let's go crazy here. Let's say we're running Cinebench R15 nonstop. So we'll put those numbers in. And we can see over the course of three years, we are definitely going to pay more for the older system. But now I'm curious because where I live, power is pretty cheap. So let's change this to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And over the course of three years, running Cinebench R15 all constantly, those prices are actually really similar. If we only ran it for two years, I'd actually be saving money by going with the older, much less efficient system. So it's important to keep in mind both the initial cost of the PC you're looking at, as well as the long-term cost of power, and that's going to change based off how much electricity costs where you're at. But I don't just want to talk about how much this is going to cost you. I, I kind of like to talk about the environmental impact of these PCs. And this isn't because I'm getting up on my soapbox and talking about climate change and everything, but I do get the comment pretty often when I'm talking about older computers that I should just throw those in the trash. They belong in a landfill. I need to use something newer that's more efficient because that's better for the environment, which is interesting because I feel like people don't take into account the manufacturing costs on the environment of those newer systems. If you look through pretty much any study that covers the environmental impact on computer manufacturing and usage, they pretty much all say the exact same thing, which is manufacturing and shipping are far more detrimental to the environment than the long-term usage. And typically the recommendations of any article I've seen are that we should try to repair and reuse stuff when possible rather than buying new stuff because that encourages manufacturing of new materials, which has a much higher impact on the environment. So I made this other little calculator here, which I think is fun, which is very similar. We have our power draw, kilowatt hours per year, but now we're looking at pounds of CO2 emissions per year. And I do have this manufacturer cost here, which to be clear, there was a manufacturing cost on the older i5 system. But if we're buying that second hand, we're not really incentivizing a company to manufacture another product. So that's why this value is zero. And then this 330 pounds value I got here, was roughly half of most of the estimates I saw for a laptop, which a laptop's going to be a lot worse because you're also having to manufacture a screen. And so this is sort of just a guess. Once again, these are not exact numbers. This isn't an exact science, but I tried to get a rough estimate based off what I could find on the internet that the manufacturer of a mini PC like this might have in terms of CO2 emissions. So that's where this 330 number came from. Now down here, we can put the number of years. So, you know, let's say two years, whatever. But then this pounds of CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour, that's very dependent on what type of power generation we're talking about, because there's very clean types of electricity generation, but there's also really not clean types of electricity generation. So for example, coal everywhere I found is around the 2.2 pounds of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So let's do 2.2. Let's assume all of our electricity is coming from coal generation. And it's, it's let's go with our, oh, we could start with, uh, 
the rough numbers here. Let's do 4118. This is our running Cinebench all the time. And you can see over the course of two years, even without having any manufacturer cost here, our i5 system is causing 1,580 pounds of CO2 emissions versus the 1,024. So in this case, the older system is a lot worse for the environment than the newer system. But what if we change our numbers to something like the idle power draw running Linux? So let's say four watts and five watts. And we'll even bump this up. I'll, I'll say like 7.4, I don't know. We'll, <laughs> once again, these aren't exact numbers. I'm just kind of giving an idea. You know, I'll go back to, I think we did 15 and five. These are pretty generous for the N100 here if we're taking into account primarily idle power draw, but also occasionally running a workload. And we can see that over the course of two years, once again, it's closer, but the i5 system is worse for the environment than the N100. But that's assuming that our electricity is entirely generated from coal. Where I live, for example, the majority of our energy comes from natural gas, followed by a very close second of wind energy, which everywhere I've read, natural gas only emits about one pound of CO2 per kilowatt hour generation. And uh, now this number starts to look a lot different. And realistically, based off where I live, wind generation is a close second, and that is closer to zero. So this number might be lower than one, but we'll stick with one. And over the course of two years, we can see that the emissions cost, just in terms of CO2 emissions, is substantially worse coming from the N100. Let's bump it up to like five years. Okay, now, so over five years, we're, we're looking at something different. Four years, we can kind of play around with this a little bit. But once again, if we just go with the straight up idle running our server, not running any sort of workload very often, over the course of 20 years, it's going to take a long time before, yeah, okay, 50 years, 40 years, let's see. All right, it's going to take 38 years before the older i5 has a worse impact on the environment than the N100. And this also isn't taking into account the other issues of manufacturing computer components like wastewater and the mining of rare earth elements and labor issues. There's a lot more that goes into it than just CO2 emissions, but I did find it interesting to pull up this actual data and see what the impact could potentially be like. And if you're just looking at CO2 emissions, by far the manufacturing stage is the worst contributor for emissions. So by reusing older equipment when possible and disincentivizing companies from manufacturing more components, you're actually making a better impact on the environment in terms of CO2 emissions by using older, less efficient hardware. Now, once again, I am not up on my soapbox here. I'm not telling you not to buy new computers. I buy new computers all the time. But if your rationale is, okay, I'm gonna buy this new computer because it's gonna be more efficient and therefore less expensive for me to run and better for the environment, it's probably a good idea to put some thought into both of those aspects to make sure you're actually achieving what you want to achieve. So hopefully this was helpful. Let's hop back over to where I'm in front of the camera over there. If you are looking for a new PC to run a home server on, anything with an N100 is probably going to be a pretty good choice because let's be honest, most of us, when we're building home servers, overspend on CPU resources. For me, at least, I've noticed that most of the stuff I run can get by without a whole ton of horsepower from the CPU, and something like this is probably going to get the job done just fine. Plus, it's really efficient, and you get some cool perks like the integrated GPU that handles transcoding really well. However, if you are running some stuff that's really demanding on the CPU, you might find that this doesn't quite have the horsepower. And you should also keep in mind some of the other limitations of the CPU, like memory channels and PCIe lanes. Because it only supports one channel of memory, a lot of the devices you buy it in are only going to have one slot, making upgradability a little bit more difficult. And because the CPU only supports nine lanes of PCIe Gen 3, even if you go buy a cool ITX motherboard like this one, you're going to be limited in what you can do in terms of expandability. Also, because of the race to zero to have the cheapest N100 PC you can buy, there's a really good chance you might end up with something that's a little bit... Yeah. I do want to thank Cambry for sending this over for me to take a look at. And if you're in the market for one of these, and you don't need dual NICs, and you can find these for a good price, it's a fairly decent option. Now, if you're interested in some other home server type stuff, maybe check out this video right here. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, especially my raid members. Stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.